morning, church. Happy Easter. He is risen. <laughs> Guys, if you would turn your attention to the screen, we're going to start off up here this morning. Indeed, let's arise because we are going to praise him this morning and we are so grateful and thankful for what he has done for us. So let's stand and sing together. Say 
singing and some of these songs, they do, they do start by just looking back. Um, we had an amazing service here on Good Friday where we were just really um, immersed in the story of what Jesus did for us and I do want you to take a moment just to reflect back to that because that's what helps us really truly celebrate today, isn't it? When we remember what Jesus did for us on the Friday and that he rose on the Sunday, that makes our hearts so thankful and grateful.
thank you. You are our living hope. Lord Jesus, you rose, you conquered sin and death. Death has lost its sting and you have the victory. Praise your name, Lord Jesus. And everybody said, amen. Thanks guys, take a seat. Well, good morning, everyone. Just a couple of brief announcements this morning and then I've got something special for some special people. So now you're gonna be looking forward to, to finding out what that is. Uh, but I just want to welcome you all on this Easter Sunday morning. It's great to have you with us uh, here. And for those that are watching online, it's great to have you watching as well. We all have different days planned, don't we? Some of us have family members that we're going to. Some have family members coming to us. Some uh, have friends. Others, uh, we remember in our prayers, those that have nobody um, to share this day with. Whatever category you fit into, we have God with us, don't we? The Holy Spirit is with us. It's because we remember this day that we know that Jesus is with us. He didn't just die on a cross. He broke free from the tomb. He destroyed the power of sin and death. And so we have relationship with him. Isn't that exciting? Isn't that what brings us together? That Jesus died and rose again. Just a couple of quick announcements then. Our giving options this morning. If, you've, um, if you're just joining us for the first time, you don't need to worry about this part. It's just a reminder for all of us that are part of this church here at Beacon. Uh, don't forget to put your offerings in on the way out or you can do it online as well uh, by the usual options. Uh, if you're not sure how, we have brochures on the way out there as well. Now, church picnic, April 7th. Notice I'm getting older. I'm having to hold it out here now to see. But April 7th, we have our church picnic after the service. So make sure you, um, if you come to the service, stick around afterwards as well and join us for our church picnic out the, on the grass there. There'll be fun and games. There'll be food if you bring it. If you don't, you'll go hungry or you can just watch the people around you and I'm sure they will share with you. So, And if they don't, let us know and we'll talk to them later. <laughs> But no, it will be a great day. Um, oh, Crystal actually wrote here, bring your own food or lunch, or you can also bring along a plate of food to share. So if you're generous, as we all are, bring something to share as well. That's all the announcements we've got this morning. Nice and quick. But before we have our time of prayer, and our, it's highlighted here, Connect Kids is on today. It's not. That's why it's crossed out in green pen. So kids, I've got something special for you. If there's any children here, if you would like something sweet and chocolatey and your parents allow you to, we were generously at the Hub donated some Easter eggs. Now, we've already taken the big ones out, sorry, because the really special people need their sugar. But any kids... If you want to come up now and grab an Easter egg, and while the children do that, if you'd like to turn to the people around you and just wish them a happy Easter. Good on you, Shifra. Someone's got to be first. What's the age cut off the girls are asking? How old is The age limit will be youth group kids. If you're a youth group kid, you can have one too. You want a different one, Shifra? <laughs> now, I've still got stacks left. None of the youth group kids came and got any. Oh, I didn't think they were allowed. They didn't think they were allowed. If anybody else would like an egg... Zoo kids, go, quick. <laughs> I will have them after the service for you. There you go. I still have heaps there. So if you really want one... Make sure you come and get one later. Snacks for during the week, yes. <laughs> so let's just come to a time of prayer then. So Father, we do thank you for the gift of chocolate. Lord, we know that that's something that many people around the world today will be partaking in. But Lord, help us to stop and recognise what the Easter egg represents to us. Lord, that it's that sim symbolism of the tomb that Jesus came forth out of. Father, that means so much more to us than, than any amount of chocolate could ever 
um, bring satisfaction to us, Lord. The fact that you have given yourself for us. The fact that you are still alive, Lord. The only God to ever break free from death. The only one to open the pathway that we may have relationship with you once again. Father, help us to see beyond the trappings of this day and see, and to look heavenward, Lord. To remember truly that this is your day. The day that we remember. And so, Father, we thank you for those that are around us, but, Father, we also think of those that are going through trials and tribulations, for those that are suffering through illness and hurt and pain. Father God, we just ask that you would send your spirit to to remind them, Lord, that they are not alone, that, Father God, that you are there walking alongside them, that, Father God, that you love them just as much as anybody else, and that, Father God, for all who call on your name as Lord and God, Lord, you have made us worthy to receive you and so father we just ask for your blessing to be upon this day lord for those that have to work for our um, emergency services personnel lord for those um, people we ask lord that it would be a quiet day for them that father god that there won't be any tragedies on our road or anywhere else and that father god that they too would have opportunity to remember what this day is all about father we pray for our governments And Father God, we um, pray for those that lead us in various capacities. Lord, whether it's um, federal, state, local. Father God, for those that work in our governments and work on our behalf. Father, we pray your blessing would be upon them as well. And Father, as we come towards another election later in this year. Father, we just pray that your spirit would reign over it all. Father God, we thank you. We thank you so much for the blessing that it is to have Jesus in our life. And we pray, Father God, that we would never forget and that, Father God, that we would live our lives in a way that brings honour and glory to your name. So, Father, bless us as we worship you today. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And we're going to continue worshipping. We're going to sing to our King of Kings. Let's stand together.
no scheme of man can ever pluck me from your hand. Lord Jesus, because you died and because you rose, Lord Jesus, we know that we are now safe in you and you in us. Lord Jesus, for that we just thank you, Lord. We want to just take a moment right now where we just let that sink into our hearts, Lord Jesus, that we are in you and you are in us. Lord Jesus, you will never leave us nor forsake us because Jesus took the punishment for us. You did that, Lord, because you love us so much. Not in anger, Lord, but in love. You did that for us. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks, church. Take a seat. Um, Stephanie is going to bring us the Bible reading this morning. Thanks, Stephanie. Good morning. I'm reading this morning (coughs) from Luke chapter 24, verses 1 to 12. On the first day of the week, very early in the morning... The women took the spices they had prepared and went to the tomb. They found the stone rolled away from the tomb, but when they entered, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were wondering about this, suddenly two men in clothes that gleamed like lightning stood beside them. In their fright, The women bowed down with their faces to the ground. But the men said to them, Why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here. He has risen. Remember how he told you, while he was still with you in Galilee, the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men, be crucified, and on the third day be raised again. Then they remembered his words. When they came back from the tomb, they told all these things to the eleven and to all the others. It was Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary the mother of James and the others with them who told this to the apostles. But they did not believe the women because their words seemed to them like nonsense. Peter, however got up and ran to the tomb. Bending over, he saw the strips of linen lying by themselves and he went away wondering to himself what had happened. Well, good morning, everyone. The Easter weekend is such a special time. Whether I'm reflecting on all that Jesus did on the cross or actually the fact that Jesus rose from the grave. Today is Resurrection Sunday. Without the resurrection of Jesus Christ, we would be stuck in our sin. So we have much to praise God for, don't we? Some people say Jesus was just a historical figure. Probably a kind man. Probably in his heart, a revolutionary, sick and tired of the oppression of Rome. And he tried to revolt and teach against Rome. But like power always does, in our world, it crushes people. Some say Jesus lived a simple, sincere life. And it was fading away. People loved Jesus. So they tried to resurrect a story about him. They took this fading historical figure and endured him with supernatural power, established a myth that he was the son of God. And as a result of various means, Jesus has been shared throughout history and society, which brings us here today. But is this really what happened? Is Jesus just a failed historical figure who has given who was given power by his followers. Are the 2.3 billion people who celebrate the resurrection of Jesus just nice people who are deluded? This is a question we must ask ourselves. A non-Christian actually 
journalist wrote these words in an interview with a pastor. He said, do you believe in the physical resurrection of Jesus Christ? The pastor did say, when you look through the Gospels, the stories do seem all over the place and there is actually no resurrection story in Mark's Gospel. So it seems that those who claimed it, the claim that it happened, are kidding themselves. The pastor said, but the empty tomb symbolises the ultimate love in our lives, cannot be crucified and killed. So if you take away the historical facts, like that pastor did, of the resurrection, it is to reduce the scriptures to a kind of sentimental poetry. And with all due respect, this this pastor is fundamentally wrong to what happened here. He believes if Jesus wasn't risen from the dead, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if there's a heaven or hell. Be loving because all that matters in life is love. However, if you go to the scriptures... Paul said this in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 17 and 19. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile. You are still stuck in your sins. Can you imagine that? If Jesus had not rose from the grave on the third day, it wouldn't have accomplished anything. Paul goes on, then those who have fallen asleep in Christ are lost. If only for this life we have hope in Christ, we are of people of most to be pitied. So the writers of the New Testament do think it actually matters what we think of the resurrection of Jesus. They think if it's not real, you're actually wasting your time. Why come here on Resurrection Sunday if Jesus had not raised from the grave? So the actual New Testament writers put forward that our faith actually depends on believing that Jesus rose from the grave. One commentator said this, apart from the resurrection of Jesus Christ, there is no saviour. There is no salvation, no forgiveness of sins, No hope of of resurrected eternal life. Apart from resurrection, Jesus is reduced to yet another good but dead man. And therefore is no considerable help to us in this life and when it ends. He goes on and plainly stated, without the resurrection of Jesus, the few billion people who worship Jesus as God are gullible. Their hope For resurrection life and life after is hope is actually really silly and foolish. Subsequently, he goes on, the doctrine of Jesus' resurrection is without question profoundly significant and worthy of most considerable examination. So today I just want to give you a worthy and short consideration of why it is that Christians persist on the resurrection of Jesus. So my three points are, why from a personal sense do we need the resurrection of Jesus? Why is there a kind of a new kind of power being released into the world through the resurrection and why our hearts need a saviour? So bear with me. Kids, it's okay if you make a bit of noise. We haven't got something on for you today. So actually, I am absolutely fine with kids making a noise in church because I'd rather have kids in church than not in church. And so, parents, I know you're doing your best, but honestly, if they make a noise, it doesn't worry me. So why, from a personal sense, that we need the resurrection? Number one, it is God's provision for our problem. This is why the Christians persist with the resurrection. Luke 24, 5 to 6. Why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here. He is actually risen. Remember how he told you? While he was still with you in Galilee, the Son of Man must be delivered over to the hands of sinners, be crucified, and on the third day be raised again. Then they remembered his words. 
Over the last few weeks, we've been looking at Jesus' final words from the cross to give us a really rich understanding of what was happening. Today, the phrase I am looking at, it is this, it is finished. There is nothing else to be done. This phrase is what sociologists described as a condensed symbol. This means there is a picture or an icon of when you touch it, you're accessing an entire system of meaning present in that one image. And that's what's happening on the cross. That is what is happening in this particular phrase that Jesus uses. It is finished. The phrase is translated telesteia, and it has a big range of meanings. So to bring it up, wasn't just to mention one thing. It was to paint a rich portrait of what's gathered around it. And what the angel says to the woman here is this. Remember Jesus had to be handed over to the sinners to be crucified. Remember there is a problem. You have a God because your sin. And because of your sin, Jesus had to deal with that. Don't you remember that? And Jesus tells us at the cross... It is finished. So what is he telling us in this phrase? It's a rich phrase. It means a lot of things. There are five things actually this phrase means. The first one is one of servants. It tells us it is used when a servant is finished a task. This is the idea of not returning until the mission or the task was complete. On the cross... Jesus is a servant of God and is returning to his father because he has finished that which his father sent him into the world to accomplish, salvation. Number two, the second way the word is used is priestly. It was used amongst the priests. The priests would examine animals for blemishes before they were sacrificed, before Because they had to offer perfect sacrifices in the temple. If the lamb was perfect, after it had been inspected by the priest, the priest would step back and say, it's it's been inspected, it's done. It's finished. Jesus, the lamb of God, the only man who ever lived without sin, who could offer himself as an unblemished sacrifice before God. Three, the word was used as artists use it. When painting of a sculpture or someone working with marble, when they'd finished their work, they would step back to see if there are any changes or any details that needed to be corrected. When they had actually stepped back and they were observing, when they looked and they realized that there was nothing else they could do, they actually mumbled under their breath. It is finished. Merchants, when there was a debt you owed, when you finally paid it, they would give you a certificate to tell you that there were no payments. You had finished paying back your debt. It is finished. The other way this word is used, it was used for prisoners. When a Roman citizen was convicted of a crime, he was put in prison and a certificate of debt listing his crime was nailed to his cell door. So people passing by could see the list of charges and the penalty. When the prisoner had served his sentence and was released from bondage, the certificate was taken down from the door and the person was consigned to him who put him into prison would write, It is finished and given back to the prisoner. So the certificate was given back. It was written on his certificate. He had done his time. If he was ever accused again, all he had to show was his certificate. It is finished. Paid in full. Here is Jesus on the cross and what he is saying. He is saying he has finished the mission of redemption. He is the perfect Lamb of God. All things are fulfilled in Him. 
There is no more debt to pay. We can go free. This is what the angel is saying. Remember, that is what Christ came to do. Die for your sin. Don't you love this? We, have, we may have taken away the language of sin in our culture, but we have not taken away the reality of sin or the experience of sin. So many people are trying to rebirth their, their lives in the world that we're living in. People want to be in places where they are not known for their mistakes. Why do you think pastors move on every so many years? <laughs> Seriously. <laughs> We make mistakes like you wouldn't believe. The problem with living in the same place, everyone remembers everything you have done. I remember coming back to Iswich, people remember what I was like on the soccer field. I wasn't pleasant. (laughs) People could remember the mistakes I did as a kid, the silly things I did as a kid. And I had to come back and live with that, even though I'm 30 years older. Often when people move, they're looking for a new start, for a new life. And no matter how successful people end up being, deep, deep down, people realize there are things in which I could not fix and make atonement for. There are things I've done against God. There are things... I've done against people in my own conscience. That is the reality of sin. So when Jesus stands before us and God, there is no more you got to pay. There was nothing more we have to pay. There is nothing more to do. It is a gift of grace. He says, I have come to rescue you. This brings so much joy to people who respond to the message of Jesus. So the reasons Christians insist on the resurrection of Jesus, it actually follows the cross. The cross and the crucifixion, we separate them. But they go hand in hand. Jesus actually dealt with our fundamental problem on the cross. That is why we persist with the resurrection of Jesus. The second thing as why Christians insist on the resurrection is because it's God's power over our enemies. And our greatest enemy is what? Death. Luke 24, 5 to 6. Why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here. He is risen. I love this because all of us deep, deep down in our hearts fundamentally wrestle with the physical universe. We live in a society obsessed with youth and we put shame on our bodies. People spend a lot of money to look perfect. You only got to go through the shopping centre and you smell those horrendous nail places I mean horrendous. Females, nothing against you, but honestly, that smell gets to me every time. I would rather walk past a food court than a nail place. (laughs) People spend a lot of money in our culture looking after themselves. You've noticed that? There's often a culture of shame if you don't look perfect. See, if we like it or lump it, and my body is telling me the older I get, we are decaying. There is this denial of death and fear of growing older that drives our society. So Sam bought a, um, I saw it on our kitchen table, she didn't tell me she, she bought this book, she just buys stuff anyway. And um, I come home and I see this book, and it's a New York bestseller on how to stop the decaying thing in your body, how to stop your body decaying. And I thought, this would be interesting to read. 
I've read the first chapter. That's all I've read, okay? And so it's a novel. It's, it's not a true book, but it's written by a doctor, um, and I'm, I'm reading it at the moment. But in 1973, Ernest Becker wrote a book called The Denial of Death. And he basically says human beings live in conflict between their physical bodies. And he basically says human beings live in, in this conflict between their physical bodies and a transcendent sense. And with the decline of religion, we are not impoverished and have not the resource necessary for the illusion, he says, of building an immortal, immortality project. There is a theory that goes along these lines, and it's called the terror management theory. Basically, the way to deal with our psych angst, which we all worry about death, is we're walking, all of us, he says, we're walking along only seconds away from our deaths. But in order to come to terms with that, the reality, we have to manage the terror of it. And there are a number of things here which he lists the way to manage this terror of death. The first is through legacy, leaving a legacy. It's accomplishing something. Whether it's in art, whether it's in business, on stage, or becoming a legend. The vision is, even after we die, we will live forever because of our accomplishments. The problem with this theory is this. People now have smartphones and social media where people document everything. And I mean everything. It's pretty sad, actually. Half the world's population is under 16. The future, if it's not ours, it's theirs, if I'm honest. Now, how do you break out and stand out when there are 7 billion people in our world all using social media? How do you do something significant when all these people are obsessed with documenting their lives? It's exhausting to, to live a life of legacy that will live forever. Well, if that doesn't work, maybe my strategy will be, so my name continues, is to get married and have a family. Let me become the patriarch of a multi-generational influence. If I can just establish a name for my family, if my children will just respect me, if I can go on passing on blessing and not brokenness over the course of time, we can become one of the great families. The third way is through biology. We're going to solve the problem with our bodies. We're going to solve the problem with technology. The obsessity with longevity. If we can just, pro, just put off the aging process. Like we all know, people are living longer this day and age through the steps and advancement of technology and science. Fourth, the last option is, is what he calls this, is the religious option. Resurrection. If you can't do it through your family accomplishments, if you can't do it through technology, then you have to do it through religious resurrection. The person who came up with these theories, who was actually a non-Christian, said all religions basically teach the same thing. Now, we know that is not true. This is where Christianity actually makes a bold statement, where Jesus actually claimed he was the resurrection and life. It was actually a bold statement. Christianity is different than any other religion in this world. Christianity is the only religion where death has been defeated by love. Christianity offers a truly definitive victory over personal immortality. 
Because of the resurrection, death is not the end. Sin does not have the last word. Cancer does not have the last word. Injustice does not have the last word. Violence does not have the last word. Jesus has the last word. At funerals for non-Christians, I hear this said so many times. They often say, that person who is deceased, who has passed away, is in a better place. But the reality is, if there is no resurrection, there is no better place. We do everything in our power not to confront death. Christianity says, no, we can confront death. The reality of death with the resurrection hope. We believe Jesus came back and broke the power of the grave. And his physical resurrection body was actually true. You know, Jesus takes that power that raised him from the grave, and if you put your faith in him, he actually puts that same power in your life. He puts that same spirit in your life. And he gives life to us, to our mortal bodies. The Bible promises, because Jesus did this, he will actually put his spirit inside each of you. When you experience not the historical figure of Jesus and not the theology of it is finished, but when you experience it, the power of the resurrection internally, like the Bible says, it actually calls it like being born again. Being regenerated. When you experience the power of the resurrection power in your own life, It will change you forever. You will feel a resurrection from deadness to life. You will have a resurrection of hope and joy and peace and purpose in your life. And this is the reason why many follow Jesus. Jesus was made more than a historical figure. Jesus is way more than just theology. Jesus can actually be experienced in your personal life. Finally, it shows us it's just not God meeting our sin. God not just destroying our enemies through death, his power on the third day. It shows us what actually God did. See, if you read the Gospels, And you come to them, you would come to this thing. See, if I was to write, if I was to write the Bible, which I didn't and which I'm not, but if I was to write a hero myth to compel the world to believe in Jesus, there is no way I would have written it like the Bible has written it. But it shows us. Jesus' heart, and I'll explain. There is this woman, her name is Mary Magdalene. She had seven demons in her, and Jesus kicked them out. And she was the first one to witness the resurrected Jesus. And she really doesn't actually recognize him straight away. Is that is how you would write your account of the resurrection? of Jesus if you were trying to influence the world? I don't think I would have started with Mary Magdalene. The records of the resurrection, no one would have put them in the story, if I'm really honest. No one expected Jesus to come back from the dead. His disciples did not expect it. Where were they? In a locked room, scared from the Roman people for their lives. We have Mary. That's the first account we're given. Then we have Peter, the one that said, 
if anyone denies you, I will not. Then a minute later, he's saying, who is this Jesus person anyway? I've never met him. Then Peter goes back to fishing like it never happened. He just tries to put that stuff behind him and go back to where he started out. Then Jesus shows up on the beach and he says, it's okay, Peter. And Jesus says, do you love me? And and Jesus says, what are you doing with the fish? Enough fish, Peter. Do you love me? Peter goes, yes. And Jesus says, feed my sheep. Your fails, your failures, Peter, do not cancel your destiny. Get back to your calling. You see this again and again. Thomas, Thomas struggles with optimism. If you go through the Gospels, he's always the guy. He struggles with it. He has doubt. So when Jesus is going to resurrect Lazarus from the dead, what does Thomas say? Let's go die too. Thomas has this pattern of missing out on everything good when it's supposed to happen. It's like when they say, Thomas, Jesus is back from the dead. He says, you're kidding me, right? He says, unless I see him, unless I put my hands in his wounds, I will not believe in him. It's just not the way you and I would write the story, correct? The reason I mention this, if I was back from the dead, there were two places I would go if I was Jesus. It kind of shows you what kind of person I am. I would go to Rome and I would go to Caesar and bang on the door. Caesar, you call yourself Lord, guess what? I'm back. Jesus had every opportunity to display his power after he rose from the dead to Caesar and to the Roman Empire. Jesus could have used his power to convert the Roman Empire. Or he could have gone to Athens and said, you want to debate the Logos? I'm the Logos. Stop debating it. I would have shown up to the world of philosophy and shown them myself. Why doesn't Jesus go to Rome and Athens? You've ever asked yourself those questions? This is the incredible thing about the Jesus that we worship. Jesus' primary concern is not convincing the world through power. Jesus' primary concern is helping his friends who struggle to believe in him, believe in him. Where does he show up? If you read the accounts, he shows up to his friends. The people that were struggling to believe in the resurrection of Jesus. In a hero myth, you would expect Jesus to rise up And go on and take on the powers of his day. And then he could rule Rome forever. It actually seems that Jesus isn't interested in what you and I would be interested in. He's actually interested in love. This is why it's important. It's one thing to have an all-powerful God who has defeated death. But if he isn't loving... What a terrible universe to live in. But then, to see a all-powerful God who had just defeated death, who had just defeated sin, who had just defeated Satan, to use that power, that resurrected power, to find those who were struggling to, to put their faith in him, And to be merciful to them. What sort of God is that? That is the God of the Bible. 
when you meet him like these people did. He will change your life. We saw the radicalness change of the disciples who were hiding in the room. Fearful of their life, when they encountered the resurrected Jesus, it changed their life forever. They were willing to die. Most of them lost their lives for the gospel message of Jesus. Why? Jesus spent time after the resurrection going to the people that he loved, the people that were struggling in their faith, the people that were struggling to believe that he had actually done this. He actually went time and spent time with them. And it changed their lives forever. If we look at our world today, I feel like we are in a culture of drowning in despair. People have lost hope in all kinds of things. There just seems to be no one in this world you can ever trust anymore. And if we're not careful, this cynicism can actually fill our hearts and we can live our lives suffocating in despair. But it's into this that Jesus speaks. It's into the disappointments that Jesus actually speaks, the resurrected Jesus speaks. We all face disappointments, don't we? That is life, isn't it? The key to life is how do you navigate the challenges? How do you navigate the despair? How do you navigate the bad news? That is where the resurrection power of Jesus actually hits home. Jesus actually wants to speak into the despair. See, despair is a death of our sense of surprise, isn't it? The belief that nothing new can happen to us. It's the way I am. It's the way things have always been. That's the way it's always going to be. For me, it's too late. Once this has been said, we're basically in a tomb. Much of us has actually died. And there's still more dying to do. That's what despair does. Why is this kind of despair so dangerous? Because the resurrection of Jesus... at the first time was meant to be a surprise, correct? It was a heck of a su surprise. You only saw how his followers, people who loved him, struggled with it. They couldn't believe it. They thought they were seeing a ghost. It took them by complete surprise. The totally unexpected... Even though Jesus had actually foretold this in Scripture, they didn't get it. The impossible, that which defines all logic, laws of nature and the wisdom of common sense, convention. When we have every angle of reality so calculated, and that's what we do in the Western society, our brains are meant to function that way. We've been trained that way to calculate everything. When we have everything figured out, when we know all the possibilities, then nothing can come along to surprise us. Sadly, our prophecy will become a self-fulfilling prophecy because we have ceased believing in God and grace in a real sense. We have slimmed God down and grace to fit into our own small minds. We live in merely despair, but also mediocrity. I know what God is calling me into this Easter, but what is he calling you into this Easter? 
What is God inviting us into this Easter? I think it's this, to crack the door of cynicism open and let the resurrection hope come into our lives afresh. You know in your heart there are things you wish you could undo. Jesus is actually saying this Easter, it is finished. I have paid for that. You can actually be forgiven. Jesus is saying, I have the power to take on the deep fear of death. The loss that all all that matters to give us a gift of eternal life and offers us mercy. Who is there like Jesus? Honestly, there is no one in our world like him. Let me pray. Lord, we live in a culture. We're part of this world. And we see despair everywhere. People are, tr- are struggling to put their hope in anything. We just don't trust each other anymore. But Father God, into the d- d- despair you speak this Easter. Because Lord, there is hope in the resurrection power of Jesus. Lord, if we're struggling to believe in you, I know you are a kind of saviour like you did. You appeared to those that loved you first and you spent time with them so they could believe. And Lord, I know you draw close to us and you open our eyes so that we could see afresh of the resurrected power in our lives and experience it this Easter. So Father God, we crank open the door of cynicism, and we open up the door, Lord, to allow the hope of the resurrection into our own lives this Easter. Lord, may we encounter you afresh. May you bring us alive through the power of the resurrection. Lord, no matter what we're facing, no matter what challenges that we face ahead of us, Father God, may we not act in despair. But God, breathe into us the resurrection hope of Jesus Christ. Because, Lord, that will sustain us. Lord, we thank you for this weekend. It is such an incredible weekend. Where we're reflected of all that you did on that cross. Lord, you saved us. You redeemed us. You reconciled us to God. You paid the ransom for us. You sacrificially gave up your son for us. And then you defeated our biggest enemy, death. Lord, fill us with hope as we go from this place today. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thanks, church. Let's um, stand on our feet because we're going to sing this last song together that just declares, he bore the cross. He beat the grave. So let's stand and proclaim, this is our God.
cross, you beat the grave. Lord, we can just thank you so much. You are our God, our King. And even though the world might tell us it's foolish, Lord Jesus, as we have heard this morning, we can trust in you. We can be so thankful for your grace and your mercy to us, Lord Jesus. And let us believe, let us not doubt like Thomas, but let us believe that you rose again, Lord. You have ascended on high and you are there now, Lord, just advocating for us. And we thank you so much for that, Lord Jesus. And everybody said... Amen. All right, church, happy Easter. Go and enjoy some morning tea together.